My message today is what I had last week, and I knew it, it, it really worked out perfectly, I, I believe, because last week I was all worried about being able to get through with my whole message. Today, y'all got to listen to me twice, so I get to preach part of the first service. You're not going to listen to me twice? <laughs> well, that's after the second service. You'll hear me twice. <laughs> But you'll, I get to hopefully finish the last part of Colossians 1, uh, 19 through 29 this morning. Reconciled or alienated? Are you, and you've got to answer this question yourself, are you reconciled with God or are you, are you alienated from God? Do you walk with Him or do you walk at a distance? You know, we all, at times in our life, get uh, garbage in our lives and we sort of walk away or we sort of back off. We sort of do something. Where are you at? You have two choices. You're either serving God or the devil. There's no in-between. The Bible talks about being lukewarm. And he says, I'll spew you out of my mouth. There's two choices. God or the devil. Heaven or hell. And then I, I wrote down the verse, uh, Romans 11.36, For of him and through him and to him are all things. Everything that we do as a Christian is to involve God. Everything we do, everything we say, every act that we make is about God. And we all get sidetracked. We all mess up. But he's always there wooing us back. He's always there calling us back. Next slide. First slide. <clears throat> he is the reconciliation. For it was for the God Father's good pleasure <clears throat> I can't speak talk. It was for the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself. Have you walked away? Have you strayed? You just don't feel as close as you used to? I've been there. I've, I've been a Christian since I was six years old. And there have been times that I have really played that game well on the outside, but not playing it right on the inside. I can promise you he's still right there. He's never left us. He's never walked away. He's never turned his back. I wrote here, and I started to ask Debbie to sing this song this morning, this in our, in, when we were picking out songs. He was there all the time. He was there all the time. Waiting patiently in line. He was there all the time. What's that mean? He never left. And when we walked away, when we got way away, or if we just tripped up, he was waiting patiently for us to come back. Never forcing, never dragging us back, but always waiting patiently for us to come back to him. First part of that verse says, For the Father's good pleasure. God created us to walk with him, it is in His pleasure that we are reconciled to Him. He chose us. We didn't choose Him. He chose us and ordained us to become the children of God. And the next part of that says, All the fullness. It says, It was for the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him. All the fullness. Paul was asserting Christ's fullness of deity. Christ came to the earth fully God and fully man. Most people, a lot of people don't accept that. A lot of, and and I'll, I'll be the first to tell you, it's hard to explain. It's hard to wrap your arms around it unless you have faith. You, you know, how can you? And, and the, the best illustration I ever got was an apple. 
But Ron's illustration of, of the deity of Christ was even better than that, and I can't even say it this morning. But it's God was fully God, or Jesus was fully God and fully man. <clears throat> because, and, and the reason this part is in here is just like what I said two weeks ago was because of the <clears throat> because of the controversy in the church in religious circles this this point was driven home uh, Paul was asserting the fullness of deity because of the divided beliefs all the divine powers are not among created beings but fully completely dwelt in God alone do we still maybe have some of those divided beliefs in churches today We've got them, we've, we've had them here. We've had them in denominational circles. We've had them in different denominational groups where we cannot agree on God's Word, but we have to bicker and fight and all this stuff. The Bible is the only source. Uh, and, and I'm going to throw it out there. And it's not just the King James Version Bible. Okay? That's probably one of the biggest divisive things that I believe the devil uses today when they start trying to take the, 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 the fact of the King James Version Bible is the only Bible that's right. Now, Tracy and I have talked about it. I believe it's probably... 99.9% .9 right. But there are some things in there. Just like a couple of weeks ago when Ron preached that message on commit sin or practices sin. Okay? That's a word that means a different thing today than it meant in biblical times. So we have to take our history, we have to take the Bible and look at it and study it and get to an understanding that's in line with God's Word, not in line with what we feel or what we think or what we think we believe. God's Word is the determining factor, not Bobby, not Ron, but God's Word. And God uses different ones to help us understand things better. And He uses, I believe, different translations sometimes to help us understand things better. Now, there are some translations that I won't bother, that I won't read. Back in the 70s, it was called the New Living Translation, right? New Living Bible. The Living Bible. I rejected that myself. <laughs> okay? Because it was a paraphrase. It wasn't a Bible. It was just a paraphrase. But we have to get away from the divided beliefs in the church, in the churches, in the groups. Um, I, I don't know if I read, but all, they believed that all divine powers were divided among created beings. But, fully, that, but they fully and completely dwelt with Christ alone. Uh, in sec, uh, this verse two, chapter two, verse eight says, "See that see that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to tradition, according to the elementary principles of the world, <coughs> rather than according to Christ." And what that was saying is, is Paul was explaining that there are out there things that are said and done to trip you up. It's directly from Satan. It's not from God's Word. And when things are done and said to trip you up, the devil wins if you fall into it. The devil wins. Back in 1975, I'm not going to call the ministry out, but I was away in college and 
I started listening to someone on the TV watching sermons. I was trying to stay close to God. Okay? I was really trying to stay close to God. And I started listening to somebody, and boy, did he confuse me. Boy, did he trip me up. And what happened was, is I came back to my church in Memphis, and I immediately went to my pastor and I said, this is what I'm hearing. This is what I think God is telling me. Can you help me? Well, he didn't, he didn't sit down and start telling me all the things that I'd done wrong. He pulled his Bible out and he said, this is what God's Word says. This is what God's Word said. This is what God's Word said. And I've told you all before about a young man that, that went off to college and came back to our church in Georgia and uh, busted, <laughs> busted the whole young married and college and career group up because he had gone off to college and joined with another group that believed entirely different than what we believed and he started teaching it in Sunday school. Or the young man that was a Mormon that, that I went with and, and, and he was my business partner and I met with him once a week, twice a week and I always led in prayer every time we got ready to eat. Well one day without thinking I said why don't you just lead in prayer? Why don't you just lead in prayer? Well, that night I got the Book of Mormons in the mail. <laughs> or the next day. I got the whole Book of Mormons in the mail. See, it's real easy. The devil, the devil uses subtle things to tear us apart, to teach us, to, to drag us away. And that's what it says. It says, the deception according to the tradition, according to the elementary principles of the world. For, him, for in him was all fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, was the second part of that verse. Dwell in him. All powers, attributes, and divine essence of the Son of God will dwell in the glorified human body of Christ. God, Jesus Christ is God. God is Jesus Christ. Now, it's the Trinity. He came. What did it say in the book of Genesis? Let us make man in our own image. That wasn't us as God and the angels. It was God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. He was there at creation. He was there at the cross. And he's sitting at the right hand of God the Father right now. So we got to understand that. We got to grasp that. Dwell in Him. All attributes, divine essence, the Son of God will dwell in the glorified human body of Christ. So Christ is the only one. Christ is the only one qualified to be God's agent of reconciliation. You can't get to heaven because you go to church. You get to heaven through the blood of Jesus, the reconciliation. You can't get to heaven because you know your Bible. You can't get to heaven because you've read your Bible cover to cover. I'll be honest, I've never read mine cover to cover. Okay? Why? Because I'm such a lousy, poor, slow reader. My wife can <laughs> add to that. I slowly, huh? So can you. I knew I wasn't going to get through this service without you picking on me. Whoop. Make me fall. I'm not a good reader. I, I, I'm, I, I can't read. I twist words around. I misspell words every time. When, when I do my messages, I have to go back. And, and correct them there and correct my notes have to correct everything because I can't spell and I'll spell it the way not on this I don't I ain't figured it out I'm not that smart either Sam. 
<clears throat> but he's the only agent. And to dwell in him, the part of this message that talks about the verse that says dwells in him, it was refuting the Gnostic heresy that Jesus was divided and not God. Do we have groups? I, I, I'll talk about my... I have a cousin. Well, I have, I'll go back further. My aunt. My aunt, before she died, 100% refuted the Trinity. Now, she was a godly woman. Uh, she loved, loved God. She said she loved Jesus. She... She prayed. She did everything. Is she a Christian? I don't know. Okay? I, I believe she is. I believe she was in, a Christian in spite of what she'd been taught. Okay? Just like I believe there are people going dying going to hell because of what they've been taught. Okay? But she died not believing the Trinity. Why? Because she hadn't studied God's Word. She listened. She let someone tell her what she believed. Don't take it just because I say it. Take it because it's God's word. And that's what this is. They were, con they were refuting the Gnostic gospel it, that, was, that was being preached. Reconciled all things. Reconcile to change or exchange. When you reconcile, what do you do when you, when you do your books? You make them come out. You change. If, you, if you know what the answer is supposed to be, you go in there and you find out where that mistake was made and you change that mistake or you change the answer depending on what balances out. That's called reconciling. And that's what God did. He reconciled. Uh, Christ is God's agent to reconcile. He reconciled all things to himself. Uh, changed the sinner's heart to a relationship with God. Did he change your heart? He changed mine. He changed mine at six years old. Did I always walk it? Nope. He had to change it again. He had to change it again because I was a Christian, but I wasn't walking the way I was supposed to walk. And I know many of us have gone through that same path. Um, it's a total and complete reconciliation. Once Christ comes and lives in your heart, it's completed. There's no taking it back. There's no giving it back. There's no anything. It's complete. It's, it's eternal security. I believe that with all my... I believe the Bible preaches it cover to cover. I'll in no way let you out. I'm sealed. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. No one can pluck you out of my hand. But reconciliation, and, and I say this, I, I, I put here, I know people get tired of me saying this. I know they do. But the Bible says that when you become a Christian, you are a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. It doesn't say that you're a new creation by all these other things. It says when Christ comes in your heart, you are a new creation. But He's not going to force it. He's not going to force it on He's not going to force your new life on you. He's not going to force you to do everything right. He's not going to force you to get off drugs or to change your mouth or to do any of that stuff. That is an enabling spirit that He's given you, but He also gave you the spirit of free will. So you have to want God's plan for your life more than you want the old life. And that's where new creation comes in. He changed your heart immediately. He washed all your sins away immediately. But you have to decide how far you're going to take it. How far did I take it for the first 30 years of my Christian life? 
not very far. How far have I taken it since? I hope, I pray that everybody sees a difference in what I was when I got saved and where I'm at today. Where I've studied, I've learned, my lifestyle has changed, my life has changed, my habits have changed. Everything about me is changed. Why? Because Jesus lives in my heart. Does that mean I'll never make a mistake? No. Does that mean I'll be perfect? No. But it means that I became a new creation when I became a Christian. Reconciliation. Surrender. When you're reconciled, you surrender. When you're reconciled, you surrender to Christ. You say, I can't do this anymore. It's all you, God. It's all left up to you. Who I am, what I am, what I'm going to be is you. As long as I hold on to my old life, what am I saying? It's me, God. Just help me through it. But when I surrender, it's you, God. Walk with me through it. You don't have to worry about him helping you because he's going to walk with you. That's what it means. Brings about a new creation. As a Christian, you will ultimately submit, but so will the lost. Think of that. You know, at the last days, the Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the saved and the unsaved. So why not now? Why, why do we play tiddlywinks with the Word of God? Why do we serve Him halfway? How did He reconcile? How did Jesus reconcile us? Through His blood. Having made peace through the blood of His cross. Who died on the cross for us? Jesus. He made peace when He went to the cross. He took the, world, the, the weight of the whole world's sins on Himself. He took all the sin of, of, of the world, past, present, and future. What's that mean? He died for Abraham. He died for me. He died for you. He died for the baby that was just born on Thursday or Friday. He's died for the babies that are going to be born in the future. He died once and for all, for all sin. Why? For unity. For fellowship. Because He loved us so much that He wants to bring His children to heaven to have fellowship with Him. Made peace. Wait, I didn't finish that verse. I say whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil, evil deeds, yet He, Jesus, has now reconciled you in His fleshly body through death in order to present you before Him, before God, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. And I have a mistype there. That word is if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you've heard. Made in peace. Once you are a Christian, you are no longer the enemy of Christ. Once you become a Christian, you're no longer Christ. Whose enemy are you? You're the devil's enemy. Especially if you... Now, let me, let me correct that too. You're the devil's enemy if you're walking with God. But if you're not walking with God, if you're just coasting along, you're not his enemy. You're probably his pleasure. Because even though he's lost you, even though you'll never lose your salvation, you're not helping God's work by being a pew-sitter or a, just a 
happy-go-lucky Christian, you're helping the devil. You're on the devil's team. Think about it. Are you on God's team or the devil's team? You're no longer an enemy to Christ or other believers. Romans 5.1 Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus. We have peace. You know, if you're a Christian, even though Sam and Valette ride me and Deb ride me all the time, pick on me all the time, we still got peace with each other. We still know that because we're believers, we're God's people. And these little gouges, these little things are just, sometimes I get upset, but most time I just brush them off. Think about it. Learn from it. <laughs> Through the blood, what happened on the cross? Christ shed his blood. That was our reconciliation. It was forgiveness. It's only through the blood. Christ died on the cross, shed his blood as a substitute for mankind. Why, why, the, why the cross? Why the blood? Because all the way back in the Old Testament, blood was used as a pattern for forgiveness of sin. They had to sacrifice animals. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. All the way back in the Old Testament, once a year, once a, and I get confused on that because different people say different things. I'll say once a year. They had an atonement. They shed the blood. They killed the goats. They killed the, the lamb. They killed the animals and put them on the altar and shed the blood. When Jesus came, that didn't have to be done anymore because Jesus Christ died on the cross and shed his blood once and for all. Christ died on the cross, shed his blood, substitute for mankind. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, <clears throat> Now all things are from God who reconciled us to himself, God, through Christ reconciling the world to himself, 14 says, in him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We have forgiveness of sins because Christ died on the cross for us. Next, word, next verse, or next word here, alienated. The Greek word means estranged, cut off, separated. We were alienated and hostile in mind, is what the Bible says, in evil deeds. Alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. That's before you became a Christian. What's evil deeds? You might, you might live a good life, but you're not living for Christ. So you're alienated from God, and every once in a while you say something, you do something, lets people know you're not a Christian. Before we were reconciled, we were separated. Hostile to God, hateful toward God. The word hostile in the Greek means hateful. Unbelievers hate God. Just like the young lady that I talked about, Nikki, that just recently had a baby. She hates God. She came right out, asked if we could pray with her. I hate God. I hate Him. He did this to me. Hmm? No. We were trying to pray for her before the baby. Okay? I hate Him. I don't want Him. So we still prayed. She just didn't have to listen. Alienated. Hated God. They hate, they resent the standards of God's words because they love evil deeds is the next part of that. Evil deeds, God hates all who practice iniquity. Psalms 5, 5 and 1 John uh, 3, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. lawlessness. <clears throat> Reconciled. 
How were we reconciled? Through the death of Christ. Through the death, burial, and resurrection. Christ took our place on the cross and paid God's price for sin. God's price for sin was blood. God turned us back on His Son so that we might have eternal life. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. I said that earlier. Uh, I jump back a little bit. Reconciled, verse 20 says, Reconciled all things to Himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross. He gave His own life for us. I believe with all my heart that if I'd been the only person alive that was dying and going to hell, died, God, Christ would have died for me. He would have died for me. It's that I'm that important to Him. And you are too. Present you holy. If you've got sin in your life, you can't be holy. But because Christ died on the cross, He's able to present you holy, spotless. Your sin is covered in the blood. So you're spotless. You have no sin. Because sin can't go into heaven. Your positional as a Christian relationship with God. Your position as a, as a Christian relationship with God. Justification will result in the union with Christ. I put here Ron's message a few weeks ago. And I still, I remember that. And I've used that over and over and over in the last couple of weeks. When I talk to people about salvation. Practice sin. When you're a Christian, you may commit sin. But you won't practice sin. There's a big difference. We all... We all stump our toe, and, my, and, and I don't cuss. I haven't ever had a problem with cussing, but I might say shoot or dead gum it. In my opinion, that's a cuss word. Now, everybody don't believe it that way. But it's a cuss word to me because it's something that I would not normally say. It's a point of aggravation. Okay? You might lie to get out of a problem. You might cheat the store clerk because they gave you too much change back. Oh, it's just too much trouble to go back in there. Got to get it back one way. But that's all sin. But you don't do it every day. There's a difference in messing up and doing it every day. Practicing sin. A foot true follower of Christ won't practice sin. Continue in the faith. <clears throat> Those who have been reconciled will practice, will continue in the faith and obedience because they were declared righteous and blameless. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he's a new cre creation, creature. The old things pass away, and behold... All things become new. Continues in the faith. Those reconciled will preserve, continue in faith and obedience. If you're reconciled to God and you're a true Christian, you can't just keep going on forever going down the wrong path. You'll end up con continuing in the faith and in the obedience to God. They're actually new creations, new creatures. I mean, it's over and over and over and over and over. It's what God says. And to close, are you a new creation in Christ? He wants you to change your life, but He won't force you. Christ, and, and you know, I, I preach these not to preach to you, but maybe to encourage you. Because it helps me to review this stuff too. Because I believe everybody in here is a Christian. Okay? And I believe everybody in here tries to do what's right. But, do we beat ourselves up when we mess up? Okay? All we got to do is ask for forgiveness. 
You still, you still, you still mess up. You still, but that's the human nature. Follow God's leading in all that you say and do. Be that person that God has called you to be. Because the world is watching you. That's probably the... Besides my salvation, that's probably one of the factors that I hold on to as much as anything. That the world is watching me. I, I told somebody this week, it was our preacher group, Tuesday morning. One of the things that stuck with me for, we were 21 years, I was 21 years old, so how many years ago was that? 50, for 40, 48 years? 41 years ago? 41 years ago. And I've used it, he used it to me as a deacon. But I have used it to people that I have led to the Lord. When you become a Christian, you move into a glass house. Everything that you say, everything that you do, everywhere you go is scrutinized. They're looking for you to mess up. Why? Well, he calls himself a Christian. Have you heard that before? Unfortunately, we don't hear it as much as we used to. Why? Because we become more like the world than like Christ. And I'm not beating you up. I'm saying Christianity as a whole has become more like the world than like Christ. Think about it. Where are you at in your walk?